This time I'll start with Calvin Nyachoki. Five and a half minutes or five? Uh, five is good enough. Good enough. Salimia Wananchi and then you say something. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning once again. Good morning. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first to the host uh, of this event, uh, Asante Sana, for having us here. And uh, we have taken a cup of tea at your cost. Uh, we appreciate uh, that. Am I speaking on behalf of everyone? Yes. Uh, so thank you very much uh, to the host of this event. And uh, to the Institute, which has partnered with the host uh, to bring us here today to have this discussion, to have this interaction, I think we want to appreciate uh, ICS uh, through uh, the CEO and the council members who are present uh, this morning and the staff. Um, straight away to go into the discussion that I've been asked to share my quick thoughts uh, in five minutes. Um, I want to contextualize, I think our moderator has introduced um, governance and has introduced ADI. So with that, I will straight away latch on it and go into, do I think it is applicable? Do we have areas where it would be applicable? Uh, I think so. So let me, let me quickly just start uh, based on a few things. We have a, a news feature that has been consistently running on our TV screens for the last um, three weeks. Anyone familiar with that uh, dispute running? Um, prominently across the country. Yeah. What dispute are we seeing on our TV screens every day? The doctor's strike. Is there a governance dispute? First, is there a dispute? Some people don't think there's a dispute. Is there a dispute? Yes. What are the contentions? There are many issues. But is there an opportunity for that dispute to be resolved? Yes. So that we don't have the, the picketing, the patients struggling in hospitals. Is there an issue that can be solved and is ADR an avenue for resolution? Yes. I think we are all saying the same thing. Uh, that's one of the most current disputes. It's ongoing. The last doctor's strike, do we remember how long it lasted? Do we remember? Uh, Uru was still president. It lasted a hundred days. What happened in those a hundred days? Two words, pain and suffering in public hospitals. I happen to be associated with one of the largest in the country. Uh, what am I saying? That there's an opportunity for the protagonists in this dispute to find an opportunity to sit across the table, drop the grandstanding, and, and listen to each other with a view of resolving the dispute. Now, they can do it by themselves so far there has been an attempt to do it between the Ministry of Health and the Doctors' Union. When it didn't result in much, oh, by the way, uh, maybe I need to make this disclosure. It is, it is myself who went to court to seek a court order against the, 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 the strike. And it, so it's KNH that went to court, got a court order, uh, which, which then has provided an opportunity Let's suspend the strike, but in the process, let's have interaction between the, the parties on the table. So if both parties would drop the grandstanding and by themselves meet and listen to each other and attempt to find a resolution, I think there's an opportunity there. But sometimes the dispute is so deep-seated that by themselves they may not be able to do it. And there comes in third party neutrals. So I think there's an opportunity for uh, Institute of Chartered Arbitrators, for instance, to be brought to the table to facilitate. At the moment, we have relied on one key resource, which is the Ministry of Labor, through their conciliation <coughs> office. But unfortunately, we don't have a solution as we speak. And so there's, there's room for others to come in and to do it. So industrial disputes is one of those forums where uh, ADR can really play a pivotal role. The second one is over the last uh, 13, maybe 15 years, I've had an opportunity to serve boards and to serve on boards. Uh, in, in those, in, in, during this period, I have witnessed and been part of it firsthand to see the conflicts that boards struggle with. 
whenever you put human beings together, there are bound to be different perceptions, different approaches, and sometimes they're difficult to reconcile. So boards struggle across the board. And one of the key things, or one of the key qualities of a good chair is the ability to intercede between uh, disputing parties within the board and help bring a solution. What if the dispute is pitting the chair against the rest of the board or some members of the board? It still requires a sober mind and a third party to intervene and help uh, resolve. Uh, my senior, Lawrence Mururi, pointed out to a case of uh, a shareholder who was a CEO, who is now turned the, the party who has gone to court to sue uh, his, his former organization. Um, so because these things have been played out in the media, we know them. One of the biggest HR suits uh, today, and the one that was decided not too long ago, involved a big audit firm. Can anyone remember? This was late last year. Do we remember? Which, which partner sued which audit firm? It's one of the big four. Do we remember? What was the award? How much is this supposed to be paid? We don't read news, we don't read newspapers. Or, or, or we, are, we don't like figures. <laughs> so, but, but there is, there is. So has the audit firm paid the amount it was ordered by the labor court to pay? No, it hasn't. The dispute continues to simmer. I think the idea was to move it to the court of appeal and challenge it and many other things. Is there an opportunity between these partners and their audit firm to meet and find an amicable solution? Yes. Uh, so between shareholders and the companies, between among shareholders themselves, between the shareholders and the directors of the different companies, uh, among its board members, between the board and the management, uh, th there, are, there are a lot of wrangles that happen in the corporate world. And sometimes they play out into the open. And, and, and is there a way in which they can be curtailed and a solution found? I think for me the answer is yes. Do we often see that happening? Sometimes we do, sometimes uh, we don't. So essentially I am saying there is room for ADR within the corporate world to be able to resolve the disputes that exist there. Uh, Chair, do I still have a minute on my five minutes? Quarter of a minute. Quarter of a minute. So, so which, 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 are the, which are the area, which are the forms of ADR that would play most to some of these uh, boardroom conflicts. The first one, I think, is negotiation. Goes without saying, the two people meet and they engage, they find a solution. The second one, which I've mentioned, which, which has been tried out with the doctor's strike, is conciliation. It's a form of ADR <coughs> using a labor officer who is a conciliator to try and help the parties resolve the same. Mediation happens a lot, quite especially within between um, shareholders or between uh, board members and the management or among its board members. And then finally, arbitration. Uh, a number of partnership agreements, a number of uh, shareholder agreements, they have a dispute resolution clause which embodies uh, arbitration. And essentially, I think there is room for you to uh, use those avenues to resolve those disputes. Back to Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yuvahad. You've uh, got both and everything. Yes. yes. Uh, very well. Now, let us go to... <laughs> All right, let, let them volunteer. Who next? Would you like to hear from the Vice Chair of the Institute? Yes. <laughs> I know how to ask a leading question. <laughs> Over to you, then I'll do something. I think Dr. Tuma has been a teacher for too long. <laughs> okay, um, I'll just pick up from where I had uh, Professor speak first. I just say, you know, he's a professor of ADR and he has summarized a whole intellectual and theoretical aspect for us superbly. And uh, Calvin, um, he's our emeritus chair, so I can call him emeritus. He has also given us some wonderful 
examples that we have seen uh, in the press and what he has been experiencing uh, in his industry. So I think to build on that, I think uh, also allow me to uh, connect with uh, our hosts, uh, NCIA, and to say first that I am also on their panel. And uh, I have had an opportunity to resolve some of their disputes. I, I signed a, a non-disclosure agreement, so of course I cannot give you all the details. But I can tell you that the matter that we did was uh, a mediation for NCIA. And uh, the parties that we had, actually fairly well-known parties here in our country, the claim was for 2.5 billion shillings. 2.5. But when I read that, I thought, now, okay, I have to sit and uh, see how I can lead these two parties into a resolution. And uh, when I looked at the origin of the conflict, I found that there were two parties who came into a joint venture to develop a real estate uh, project. Uh, develop, I think, uh, a number of unit, more, unit, units, more than 360, in a very high-end area. But unfortunately, uh, the work they had agreed upon did not materialize. So one party gave the land and the other one gave the expertise. And then the funds ran out. And of course, they started fighting. So for me, that became um, an area where I could think through how we could resolve this dispute because we had two companies. And you know, with two companies, that means that there are shareholders, there are directors, there are dynamics about are we going to be able to get um, the resolution, and when I say resolution, I'm talking about the board resolutions, to even get the parties into the meeting. They were armed to the teeth with lawyers. But the long and the short of it, I think, Loris uh, 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 is our chief registrar. Um, it took us 90 days to resolve that uh, dispute from start to finish with parties who did not even want to look each other in the eye. Now, why do I use this example? First of all, I think we also need to appreciate that ADR can be used even in the corporate, um, in the corporate sector. You know, when we learn about corporate governance, we go and we are taught a lot of wonderful theory, you know, Corporate governance is about systems, about procedures, you know, we have organs, we have boards, we have departments, and uh, sometimes we lose sight of the fact that the people who are manning these boards, these organs, these departments are human beings. And this is now uh, where we start thinking about the resolution of governance disputes. Human beings will always disagree. It is natural. You would disagree with your children even about whether you're getting out of the house and are we getting on time and your children get out of the house and they will be upset. The tone, it can be anything. The origin can be anything. So when we were dealing with human beings who are adults, whom you come from different backgrounds, different disciplines, and I can, um, I think many of you, uh, I think Karanja said, FCS Karanja said that we introduce ourselves as advocates. Tell me whether this is a true scenario. When you go for your meetings, your departmental meetings, the marketing guys will be like, this thing is stuck in legal. Yes, <laughs> you've heard that. Eh? A child will be saying that, Wakili, the lawyers, accounts, the same. If you have technical departments, they always say the same issue. So when we teach that corporate governance, that the, uh, the, the, we call them company secretaries or corporation secretaries, they tell you that you are the conscience of corporate governance. Now this is where you will distinguish yourself from a mere advocate. Yeah? When we are advocates, we are taught about being adversarial, gladiators in suits. Now if you have a conscience of corporate governance in your institution, the first thing, and I think this is, I, I want to speak about the how, how you can incorporate uh, govern, uh, uh, resolution of disputes uh, through ADR in your institution. Create an internal dispute resolution mechanism. That works. It works like magic. If you create 
an internal dispute resolution mechanism that speaks to your culture, that speaks to your structure, that speaks to the people who you are working with, that speaks to the different disciplines who are represented in your institution, um, and you involve them in putting that uh, internal dispute resolution mechanism, you get by in number one. You get a formula where people can go and say, you know, the accountants are telling us that we are over budget, and then the marketing guys are saying that we need to market. We're not able to get our product to the market because we have not been able to fulfill what we need to do because we have not been given the resources. So once that is in place, then it provides an easy mechanism to resolve. Now, why do I recommend this? I recommend this because in Kenya already we have um, a precedent. The Supreme Court has even spoken to this, uh, the exhaustion of remedies. I think that doctrine has now become such a rule that we are now proving it in the exceptions to the rule. What that means is, if you have an HR dispute and you have put a mediation policy for work-related disputes, nobody is going to go to court before they engage the mechanism for mediation. And you look at training your people in mediation from interdepartmental, uh, sorry, in fact, intra-departmental conflicts, and then inter-departmental conflicts. Eh? And then once you move from there, you may have a situation where, um, like the doctors have, there is a dispute between the workers and the management, the union and the management. So if you think through this whole process, and if you train your members through this whole process, what happens is that people start talking to each other. Many disputes come out because of a lack of communication between the people or the personalities who are involved. And the dispute can be about uh, Padians that people are being sent to conferences, others are not going, some are going for international trips, some are being sent to the ones in Nairobi, some are being sent to the ones in Naivash. Am I speaking to, some, to somebody? Those are the things that we come across on a day-to-day -day basis. So to avoid people getting to the point where they are saying to Kutane Kotini, I think there needs to be a proactive approach to how we deal with it within the corporate governance structure. And if you're able to implement it, it is going to work like clockwork. So that by the time you're finding anything, get it out. This is the other area I want to talk about on uh, ADR and uh, resolution of uh, governance disputes. Our disputes can be internal, our disputes can be external. Our disputes can also be with our auditors. And we also, we have auditors, don't we? Yeah. And we enjoy having them around. Now, I could go on and on and on and on, but I'm throwing my eye here, and I am seeing like there might be a comment from Professor, but allow me, Prof, just to say one more thing, because this is some of the things that I really, really like talking about. When do we talk about external, I think, and Prof talked about ESG, environmental social governance. This is not a new animal. This is something that we have been living with. Uh, we have been talking about sustainable development for <coughs> ESG is really now coming to speak the language of governance experts. ESG just means what is environmental, identified, disclose it, report it. It has not been reported, what do you do? You say, comply or explain. If you don't explain consecutively, then you may have a regulator who is going to question you about it, and it may end up in a dispute resolution process. So that is ESG. Can I say something about artificial intelligence? Because it is also mm -hmm. an issue that is going to impact us significantly. <laughs> We'll be talking about technology, we'll be talking about innovation, we'll be talking about disruption. We'll be talking about data, uh, we'll be talking about data scrapping, we'll be talking about very many issues within the technology space. And then ChatGPT happened last year. And ChatGPT changed everything. I'm not talking about it like it is something that is present. It is past tense. Past tense in technology for 10 months, for 18 months, which is where we are heading, means that the world has changed 
forever. So this is what I would encourage each and every one of us to do because it's, we need to be able to deal with uh, AI. We need to look at AI governance. The questions of ethics, it is going to affect each industry differently. It is going to affect public sector differently from private sector. And it is also going to create its own genre of disputes. We're going to have a lot of work on our hands, and it's going to be extremely exciting. Now, I know people have become hysterical about it and telling us it's the end of the world. It is not the end of the world. It is just the end of the world as we know it. So what I am encouraging every person to do is to train, 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 build your capacity, become AI competent, because the first dispute we're going to have is when the machines come and take over, and the first dispute will be, where is my job? Yeah? And our jobs might evaporate if you don't build your capacity. So build your capacity yourself. Build the capacity in your industry or your department, your institution, and also build capacity with your mentees. And bring your mentees on board, because your mentees already know more than so um, you said I'm a patent agent. One of the areas we have a big issue is copyright infringement, patent uh, infringement, and that is also going to create more. Uh, I like to look at it. I'm a I'm, I'm, I'm an optimist. I look at the opportunities. But Kekoko is getting very very keen. If I, if you looked at their last issue, the only issue they discussed was artificial intelligence. That is a regulator. What that means is that very soon we are going to be dealing with them on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Resolving governance disputes. Prof, thank you for giving Now me. we know, uh, for, at least from Nyacho, that uh, it doesn't, it's, uh, he says it starts from uh, negotiation. But we've been told it starts with the eye. <laughs> that eye you have given me. There was this bull from our village. We know that we come from the same village. And uh, that fool looked at an old man at about 9 a.m. in the morning. And the old man said, the way that bull has looked at me is not good. <laughs> and everybody laughed. But uh, by about 3 o'clock when he came back, he was gone and killed by that. So let us agree, it starts with the eye. But seriously though, doesn't uh, conflict start from inside somewhere? So that in those corporations where so and so is being chosen to go for that trip, so and so is favored, so and so is from this village, this place is run by people from this village, those are called conflicts and they are there, they exist. And it is said that conflicts can be latent and patent. The ones that have come out or the ones that are similar. The aim of conflict management is to deal with all of them. So reflect on things like. Uh, I've had them before, like self-mediation, peacekeeping without, within yourself. You see, that cow did not have peace that day inside itself. Is there such a thing as a peaceful mind? Yeah. That you walk out of your house with a peaceful mindset. All right? Is the uh, conflict management culture, are we any different? Does it matter where you come from? China, US, where? Who is this who tells the other one, I'll take you to court? Who is this who says, we must live in harmony? So where you come from, your, the state of your mind is also very, very important. And uh, these disputes occur within that internal space and external space, Dr. Mutoma. Anything about cows? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 want, I want to discuss why that cow appeared very peaceless when it started. <laughs> Uh, you know, most of us in this room, um, how many people are advocates here? Let me just see by show of hands. Just advocates, also not a uh, you know, CS profession is drawn from different. Where can you just put it up by high? Yes, okay, very, very good. Um, we are trained, as a, you have the BC saying, with a particular lens and it's an adversarial lens. So we enter into the room with boxing gloves. Um, we are thinking about our rights, and not necessarily what is right to do, 
but what is a right? There is where the problem starts. Uh, earlier on, I think uh, Lawrence was saying, or oh, it was a uh, FCS Karate, one of them said, you guys are a new generation, the future we were promised and will probably <laughs> now be realized by you guys. So you need to rework two major uh, issues, particularly as a CS, where you are the conscience of uh, the corporation and you can influence what capacity development looks like. The first, build emotional intelligence. And the EI is so big, there's been so much focus on IQ and technical competence. So you, sometimes you have a room, even at the board level, you had about internal disputes, or even with stakeholders. You are very intelligent people, but people with a very poor EI. And it doesn't matter what disputes are going to be just following that group. The discussion we've had so far has assumed that we are already starting to resolve a dispute that has emerged. But here is my wisdom. Can you try and prevent it before it emerges? That is your world of EI, emotional intelligence. If I was to summarize that concept, it has two sides in it. One, how much do you know about yourself? And can you control what is happening inside? You know, there are people internally either they don't know, uh, or even if you know, they can't control. So we have even some diseases, like psychological diseases that are based on that. You have bipolar, a very, very serious uh, illness because of the inability to control like a thermostat who you are. You can have board members who don't have that thermostat. Either they don't know who they are, there are some very interesting disjunctions. You can find someone saying, shouting very loudly, I am the most humble person in this room. No, 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 Because you are disqualifying yourself just by your behavior and what you say. So sometimes you see that happen. If I has another component in it, which is ex external, your awareness of what is happening around you. Um, your human beings are meant to have a decent uh, pair of eyes to know people are mourning, don't laugh. You know, that kind of, you should be able to see. Now, that guy who was hit by the ball, one of the problems, he had a very poor EI external uh, spectacle lens. He could not see there is an angry bull here. So we say to the chair, when you enter into a room, you should be able to read what is happening in that room so that you can direct the conversation. And please stop the dispute before it actually happens. So know the external, but also know how to relate to that, that external. You know, there are people who might know what is happening, but they lack empathy. Uh, they can see your crying, and the first thing they ask you is, what you have heard those people. So you as a corporate uh, secretary, you need to be thinking about capacity from this context. The other area that you probably need to think very deeply, Kenya is generally, we have a teacher's culture. To put on our way, continue. We are very like, there's always this joke that is cracked about uh, you when you meet a Kenyan in Nairobi and you have met the counterparts in uh, Tanzania and Uganda. You, you suffer what you call a cultural shock. Because the greetings here that were taking five minutes in Uganda just to find out how are you, when did you arrive in Kampala, you know the way they take time and they serve you very well. When you land here, people greet you as they are moving, isn't it? They are very little, the atmosphere in the room is very aggressive. Now, we have this culture that has come and it has hit us. We are fighters, just gender. Yeah? They, I remember there is a joke, I don't know, before the gender people knock me, there was a joke of the young man who was trying to marry a woman. So he went somewhere to Uganda, he saw the way they were moving. Now, when he went to Uganda, he went to Uganda, he went to Uganda, 
and they came here, I be met with a Kenyan woman. Let me not complete the joke because there's a, there's a serious, there's a serious gender empowerment leader here. She will be on my my neck. Um, but that culture, it is up to you to start thinking uh, within your organizations how to change it. And culture is actually where everything rises and falls. So there is a dispute culture that you have to meet and bring and solidify until it's the way of life of that organization. So some of those cultural elements you have, you introduce them through an IDRM policy, an internal dispute resolution mechanism policy. And you see that policy constantly. You also introduce the idea of safe spaces, you know? Sometimes disputes like you were hearing, I think it was either one of my colleagues, they were saying they simmer. And they simmer because they don't have an outlet. So you think there is peace, but they say the absence of war does not translate to peace. Guys are just waiting for that moment that it goes on fire. I'm pretty sure even with a lot of the industrial disputes that we are seeing, somebody somewhere failed to handle what was already simmering, and it was just going to blow up. So culture is about you knowing uh, how do you bring those safe spaces inside your organization, um, including, she talked about internal and external dimensions of disputes. Some of the external dimensions is uh, because you don't even have a whistleblowing policy that is effective. So before you know it, is Robert and I in the room just make a cue? Before I say what I have to say, you know those guys, we fear them very much. They can marry you in one day. Um, you, you have a, the thing is, so being some buzzword and is moving all over, and you're wondering, oh my God, what has happened? The people have no space to air what are the problems. And even worse, they might be a token kind of platform. But everyone has a go to HR if you have got any complaints, but everybody knows HR is in whose pocket? The CEO. So there, you have gone to HR, but you know it's as good as FCS Karaja having the information. So these are the troublemakers. <laughs> so create one that guarantees that you will not be victimized, and then you will be able to stop disputes before they, they come in. The last part of culture, I think, is what you had the distinguished panelists speaking about, and that is essentially what ADR tries to do. It tries to aim at a win-win outcome. That is essentially uh, the heart of what is they, they try to seek in that. Whether you're dealing with that continuum, it's always win-win. Because there are many ways disputes are solved. And sometimes the way they are solved leads to other disputes just waiting. There are those guys who basically you solve a dispute by competition and the last man starts. You've met those people, my way or the highway. They bully you into submission, you accept, yeah, this is the answer, but you are similar. There are, there are people who of course are very, very brutal. They force you into compromise. So you actually either compromise or you accommodate or you end up with emotions like I've tolerated. So you know someone who is tolerating uh, is a very dangerous person to have in the vehicle because they seem like they are traveling with you in the same direction, but they are just waiting for the day. Have you ever been in a matatu where the fare is hiked and then there is silence? Have you ever been there? Emma? We are talking to strangers. The bourgeoisie, yes. the bourgeoisie are here. Maybe we better be careful. Yeah? But when that thing is going, and everybody has been told either Misho, Sio Mani, Uliko, Nafkiria, Mitashuka, that it is turning, or the money, the money has gone up, there is what you call a, a silence. Yeah? And, uh, Everyone just it moves. And it just waits for one character. <laughs> Only one character at the corner. That guy went Akizusha. <laughs> Fire. In the Lipuka Apu Apu. So don't think tolerance, compromise, or accommodation has resolved the dispute. 
instead, these mechanisms that you are hearing from our colleagues, this win-win, I think the idea is more and more towards collaboration. So everybody gets out feeling that they own the outcome, and then, uh, as Prof said, after the outcome, there are many other things. You don't just solve a dispute, and then you don't put in place the supporting mechanism to make sure that it is sustainable. Prof, back to you. Thank you, uh, Chair. And Chair, I'll give you a uh, chance in two minutes, because you are, she's going to drop out for some reason at 9.30. But before then, you've heard uh, that uh, these things are relational, the disputes are relational. You must relate to a person for it to be there. And uh, by now you know the conflict is what is simmering under. It's always there, the tensions between people who are pulling in different directions, ideologically. And many, many other interests are pulling in different uh, directions. So there is the place of culture, don't forget that. What culture are you getting into? If you want to resolve a problem or a dispute, you must understand the culture. If it is uh, Muslims, for example, you don't go there dressed like a non-Muslim. Indeed, you may not be welcome. If you're going for dowry, you expect food. <laughs> that negotiation, there, if it's a kanban, you take firewood. So please study what is it that is the minimum that is required of you. What is the culture in that organization? And before you purport to be a dispute resolver there, find out what is the culture. And you've seen big disputes like Boeing. Uh, I was hoping yesterday you're not flying using a Max. Boeing Max. <laughs> the culture is the culture of hiding things. And it has cost how many people so far? So think about the cost of conflict itself, and I would like you to address that as you finish. Uh, and then ESG, you tell us what it is. You could have a, a bullying culture, like uh, this organization run by this guy called PDD. What is, what is eating it? <laughs> it is a bullying culture, and it's been exposed across a very long time. How can that conflict be? resolve if at all, you have to look at that culture and do a reality test. What is happening here? Yeah, called a friend of mine the other day. He lost his boss. I'm sorry, the boss just dropped dead in, the, in, in his house. And I called to say, Pole. And the guy was laughing. <laughs> He's saying, thank God he died. It's over. It's over. I'm so, so, so happy. He was happy for a week. He was glowing <laughs> like this lamp for a week because his boss died. I'm yet to sit him down to ask him, what is this you have <laughs> against your boss? You're not going to take over his job. But you can see his happiness has come back, his glow has come back. And so have the glow of five other members of staff. <laughs> yes, now talk to us. Well, the cost of conflict is actually very high, and uh, I think that's where Prof wants me uh, to start. Uh. Mm -hmm. Now, um, let's look at it first from the position uh, of man hours, <coughs> and also uh, resources used or misused or abused, uh, for that matter. It is. Um, well, there's a science now behind calculating what the loss has been, and uh, what we tend to say is this. When we look at the cost of conflict, the lost man hours, of course people are being paid a, a salary. Um, when you also look at uh, productivity, if people are sitting in, you know, I think you all have those water fountains, huh? and I think that is where staff go to congregate to complain, Edu, can you imagine what she did? He did all he said. Have you heard? <coughs> that time wasted over there also impacts on the productivity of your institution. So when we have a cultural issue, and you know, culture is, culture is very interesting. And whether every institution has a culture, uh, whether we acknowledge it or not. And when we, I think, is it? I think the, the, the gurus are here. 
was it Peter Drucker who said that uh, culture eats strategy for, for breakfast. And it eats strategy for breakfast, for lunch and dinner, everything. It just takes over everything. It doesn't matter how wonderful your strategic plan, your objectives, your goals, everything that you have set out to do. If the culture is not aligned to the strategic plan, it is going to be a document that is going to gather dust, uh, dust on someone's desk or in a shelf somewhere. No matter how big the launch was, no matter who you invited for the launch. So addressing culture is critical because it does have an impact on the bottom line. And now I think the reason why Prof asked me to talk about ESG is that <coughs> the bottom line is not just about profit. Eh? ESG basically says, let's listen to, let's look at people, yes, there's purpose nowadays, there's planet, and there's profit. Profit actually comes number, f number four, or number three, if you drop out purpose. But I like to include purpose because it is the whole rationale for uh, ESG, and that is stakeholder <coughs> engagement. Because if you look at environment, Yes, you look at your employees, that is your internal environment. Um, if you look at, and, and, and Prof is shaking his head here, but the term environment has many, many uh, definitions. He talks about natural resources, biodiversity, and of course climate change. Those are external to the institution. So it is important for us when we, and I think there's a taxonomy that has been developed by the European Union, which now lists what is internal to an institution, what is external, and environment does include your people, it includes your suppliers, it includes your customers, to such an extent that in the EU, what they have said from 2023, they gave their countries, all their members, one year, to put legislation in place which would mirror the uh, EU directive <coughs> on sustainable finance. That is, define what ESG is, define what comes under the E, the environment, define what comes under the social. Social also talks about culture, it talks about women, it talks about discrimination. Diversity is a huge thing, diversity and inclusion. And in fact, defining it has become the most complex endeavor in our time. Demographics, um, it's like a time, they call it, they're calling it the ticking time bomb of our time. You know, we've heard about Black Lives Matter, we've heard about Blue Lives Matter, we've heard about all kinds of lives matter because everybody is now getting into the space of um, how do you identify? Yeah? I identify as she. <laughs> <laughs> of course, there are other opportunities or alternatives. He, him, I'm, I'm not speaking for them, I'm just assuming <laughs> some people get a bit excited when you say uh, he, him, there's they, them, yes? So all these issues and questions become such a big issue and we are going to be reporting about them and this is why I'm getting to each country in the EU has to put legislation in place to ensure that that taxonomy is being followed, that disclosure and reporting is being done, the consistency of those reports, the consistency of who the stakeholders are, uh, mainly it's investors and shareholders, but there's government regulators, and then of course there's civil society because we have the climate action activists, they also have to be involved in uh, being advised. And then the reason I underline suppliers is uh, because even what is happening with an organization in Kenya or in Africa, provided they have a branch in an EU country, is going to require to be reported. So we are moving into a space and a time and an era where there is going to be so much compliance required. Thank you. Two questions for you before you wrap <laughs> Two quick questions this side. Anyone for her? She's going off. Uh, yes, uh, say your name and then. Uh, after you answer properly, you're free to leave. <laughs> thank you. My name is Wasegas Kevin, uh -huh. and thank you. He spoke my mind. 
Adalia when she was introducing the topic. And still, I will do a follow-up in regards to, we are related to the fact that the country where we are in, and there is no link between the external influence, the boards that currently exist, and also the in-person in terms of governance. So at, that, at what point do we, do we delete it? Because you would say there is a board, but somebody has appointed that board. It's supposed to serve the purpose of that board. But there is still an influence that is incoming there. Thank you. You will comment and then somebody from here? Yes, I see you. Can I ask a question? My name is Anne Musel. Uh, my question is, you mentioned for us, yes, can create a mediation policy for a company, so that staff do not turn off to court at the first instance. So how would you successfully implement one uh, where there was nothing before? Very well. And the last half a question, just half a question. No, I, 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 I just have a question. Eh? Uh, my name is Emma. Uh, my question is, we understand that conflicts occur within the boards. What sort of document do we provide for ADR mechanisms? Is it a board charter or where? Because I know the board charter is what governs the, how the board is run. Um, and when you look at most board charters, they're really silent about you know, how disputes will be resolved in, within the board itself. Okay, and uh, those two are related to that. I hope I remember all the questions because I forgot to carry something to write with. Um, where do we find, and this ties in also with the question that you asked about how do we implement. First and foremost, if you do not have a pre-existing internal um, dispute resolution mechanism, then you have a wonderful opportunity. Yes, and, and I said I'm an optimist, so I always look at things half full as opposed to half empty. You have the chance to write and create a policy yourself. So if you're sitting on the board, um, the one I've seen, and, and, and the other thing I think we've, we've told you this very, very many times, there is no silver bullet. There's not going to, I'm not going to tell you, you must put it in your board charter, because <coughs> it's not all organizations that are able to put it in their board charter. Some may have been able to put them in their constitutive documents. I've seen some there. Uh, although they tend to be very vague. If there's a dispute referring refer to the chairman, no? it's the perpetrators, yeah? Kenya branch. So you have an opportunity to say that there is the principle of resolving disputes in ADR. If it is not in your constitutive documents, then fall back on the constitution. Article 159 says, this is what, uh, when it comes to dispute resolution, because this is actually the, the, the judicial principles. So in any area where there is to be a decision that may have an impact on a person's rights or interests, then you fall back on Article 1. C. And then think for yourself, this is the circumstance that I find myself. We are a company with 100 people. It may not be the same with uh, Kenyatta, KNH, uh, where Calvin uh, is a company secretary. They have thousands of workers. If you have very many people, you may want to look at a graduated approach on how you deal with uh, internal dispute resolution. Do not write it yourself for yourself. Otherwise, you'll be creating a document for the shelf. See that it gets into the board and get a resolution from the board that we will develop an internal mechanism, or whatever you're going to call it. Internal resol uh, dis dispute resolution mechanism. Choose the name that works for you and your board. And then ask the board to give you and your management team and work with your CEO. I hope you're not the ones who uh, the chairman is here, the CEO sits here, and the CS sits on the other side because we are all helping for authority, authoritative or executive power. And then work with the CEO, work with the heads of departments. Get them to buy in and then tell them we will start the IDRM from the 
uh, from the workers to the supervisors to the <coughs> management, depending on how your structure is. And then sit down, have a town hall, a kamkunji, I think that is what we call it in Kenya. And then it, and expect it to be stormy in the beginning. But be consistent, be deliberate. The things that are developed organically tend to be accepted by everybody and they tend to stick. So that is a very high level summary of what you can do to put an IDRM in place for your institution. For the board members, what I have seen work best is uh, get it introduced to them when they are doing the board evaluations. Our board evaluations sometimes we tend to do them upside down. Please, board evaluation starts with setting of targets and then we can evaluate after we have achieved the targets. One of the targets should be either to set up an IDRM or to apply ADR mechanisms for any dispute, even at board level management or within the whole structure of the institution. I'm not sure I can remember the whole question. Don't you say something about it? Because you spoke first. I don't know whether I understood it correctly. If it has not been answered. The People, the theory. Let's talk about the theory, yes? The theory is you are appointed, you get into the institution on the board level, and you act in the best interest of the organization, whatever you have been seconded, yes? Yeah, you, are, you, are, you, are, you have been sent by the attorney general. When you go to NCIA, you act in the best interest of NCIA. Please, people, I know we like to be of people who are rule references. Please perish that thought. Understand. Please understand this, that there's this thing called emotional intelligence. And with that comment, I'm passing the baton to Dr. Mutuma to tell you how emotional intelligence helps you in that circumstance. You have always to adopt a balancing act. Yes? That's okay. Before you pass it on, say the last one so that we can release her, isn't it? Okay. Your last? Okay. Yes. Um, I am an optimist, yes? I believe that. And please take this to the bank, huh? Which bank? <laughs> <laughs> Let me finish. Take this to the bank. You know, um, and this is okay, I'm writing on this. We stand at a point where everybody is talking about existential risk. No? Everybody is telling us about what is coming to an end. There is absolutely no hard proof that the world is coming to an end. The hard proof that we have is that change is going to happen. And the change that is happening has made everybody in every single sector to say that they want regulation, they want governance structures, they want compliance. Who are the experts in this area? It is with us. Yeah? If we seize this opportunity, we have an opportunity to guide how the world responds to climate, the climate emergency, climate change, and also to the technological innovations and disruptions that are happening. Thank you. We give our hand and we release her. Thank you. Free to go through this site. <laughs> Joseph, let's uh, wait and see. Uh, she has made it. Those who are wishing, she made it. <laughs> now we are back. But uh, what we are going to do is uh, let's have your last word, last word, and then we take uh, a few interventions and we move forward. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, let me, let me just touch a little bit on the very first question that was asked. Let me, let me set the context if I understood it correctly. You, 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 you refer, you, you, the context of your question is on public sector boards. This public sector board is appointed by an appointing authority. If you are the chairman, under the State Corporations Act, you are appointed by the president. If you are a board member, chances are you've been appointed by the line ministry, the cabinet secretary in that line ministry. We are all familiar with that setup. 
it's the setup under the State Corporations Act. And then there are occasions when ex officio board members are nominated by certain, you're an alternate, for example, to the AG, you're an alternate to the PS, you're an alternate to the CS, uh, and, and you've been uh, nominated to sit and represent someone on a board. And his concern was where you would have expected to see independence in the person who's been appointed, you then see their actions being subservient to the appointing authority. Did I understand your, the context of your question correctly? And his question is this. First, how do we deal with that? How do you, how do you resolve that conundrum which you find yourself? So I, I first echo the words of uh, the vice chair who's just exited. Emotional intelligence is indispensable. Uh, my colleague, Dr. Mutuma, has, has tried to underscore what emotional intelligence is. It's just self-awareness about yourself and then awareness of the external world you're dealing with and who you're dealing with. And then reacting in accordance to that understanding. So, so it's, it's important to not give a textbook answer. That this is the textbook answer. The textbook answer says, if I get sent by LSK, I get elected by LSK members to represent them in JSC, I, as the representative, when I get to JSC, I should focus my interests, I should focus all my endeavors in the best interest of JSC. That's, that's the way it's expected. But remember, you are a representative. You've been sent. There's an expectation on your end that when it touches on matters of, advocates like to call it bread and butter issues, when it touches on those things, you will articulate the position of NSK. For example, recently, we saw something about opening Huduma, uh, courts in Huduma centers, where you will be served by Huduma attendants. <coughs> in essence, advocates perceived it like you'll be taking away our bread and butter, and judicial work or legal work will then be performed by Huduma Center attendants rather than legal practitioners and judicial officers. So what is the right conduct of this representative of LSK in JAC. So you have to balance out competing interests. But in my balancing out, the concluding comment is if it's completely irreconcilable between what your nominating agency wants and what is good for the institution that you are sitting to represent, then the card for the institution you represent should prevail. So what am I saying? Reconcile first. But if you can't reconcile, if today there's a discussion to kill JSC, and LSK wants you to kill JSC, then you need to stand up and say, no, what is in the best interest of the organization that I, I sit in, and because that's what I serve. But many times, if you exercise emotional intelligence, then you are able to reconcile the competing uh, claims. So that, that, that's my view, and um, I think it's a best practice view, but of course, different people would have different thoughts about, about it. Uh, my closing uh, comments. More now, where do we go from here? What do you see going forward and so on? Okay. So let me, let me contextualize it this way. We are governance practitioners, we are legal practitioners. What, what, what do you see as your contribution? Where do you see yourself in this discussion we're having? How do you contribute to it? A lot of you, uh, I listened to the introduction, some of you are um, entrepreneurs. You run your own firms, either CS firms or legal firms or accounting firms and that kind of thing. A good number of you are working for organizations 
as internal resources, either as the advocate, as the company secretary, uh, uh, many other positions. How do you contribute to this nexus of resolving governance disputes by way of ADR? So one of them has already been flogged, and I don't think I need to belabor it, which is to develop internal policies that, that highlight that and provide an opportunity for that. <coughs> The second one is as you draft documents which are at your disposal, try and entrench dispute resolution provisions within those documents. For example, as an arbitrator, I have had the opportunity to handle several disputes, employment related, where the letter of engagement or the contract or the offer letter actually provides that in the event of a dispute between the employer and the staff, they shall resolve that dispute by way of arbitration. And, and it comes and you help resolve uh, that dispute. So, and a lot of you in the room are also advocates. You are charged with drafting contracts. In those contracts that you draft, uh, what, what kind of dispute resolution clauses do you put there? Are they sufficiently well drafted or do they themselves become a source of a dispute? I think you have a challenge where you can entrench dispute resolution, in particular ADR, as a form which can help resolve uh, disputes. The third one is, um, I was, uh, let, me, let, me, let me touch on the last two items. The, first, the, the third one is this, you, you have opportunity to sit where decisions are made. And I'm just falling back on something that my colleague Dr. Mutuma mentioned earlier on. You have an opportunity to see things, read the room, conceptualize what it means, and then react and advise appropriately. I belong to that school of thought that the CS never sits on the corner table to take minutes. I actually sit on the main table. I sit right next to the chair. Why? because I am reading things constantly which the chair might not even realize. And the moment I read them, I am the conveyor of those things to the chair. You can see people yawning in the room, you can see people's sugars are, uh, are down, you can see conflict is rising to a crescendo. You're reading these things in the room. You're there to tell the chair, uh, chair, I think it's time for us to take our tea break. What, what you've ju just done is you've arrested a situation that was about to go out of hand. In, in the manner in which you conduct yourself, in the manner in which you introduce yourself, emotional intelligence can't be overstated. And so contribute to arresting disputes by yourself being emotionally intelligent and choosing avenues, choosing <coughs> interventions which help arrest disputes. There's something called dispute avoidance. Put it at play, and it works, and it works very well. And if disputes have already broken out, be the peacemaker. Be the, be the one who helps people resolve those disputes. I, I, there's a board I am sitting on at the moment where people have been preoccupied in the last several months with infighting that no one has talked about performance. So. People are, pre are preoccupied with how do I self-sustain, how do I self-preserve, rather than how do I take the institution to that next level. So arrest to those situations because they drain us of energy, of emotions, of time, of resources, which are then channeled in the wrong direction instead of being channeled in the right direction. And finally, um, I... I think many of you in the room expect at some point you will have a dispute with the taxing authority. Kerry. Do you do you see yourself having a, a dispute at some point with Kerry? Do you see it as yourself or do you see it as part of the organization? Which one comes to your mind? <laughs> he sees himself fighting with Kerry. Do we see ourselves in that situation? Any serious person who does anything that generates revenue, you should countenance, you should expect that at some point you will have a run-in with Kerry. 
and because you work in organizations, either your own organization or the organizations you've been employed to work in, you should also countenance and expect that you will have a running with care. As and when they, it comes, what, what's your reaction? What would be your reaction? Today, if they served you with an order to do an, an, an extensive audit for the last five years of your organization or of your own taxes, what's your reaction? What do you, what do you have coming out of you? Is it let's meet in court? Is it you, you cower and hide under the table? Uh, is it let's fight it out? Is it let's come do the audit? Let's pick it up from there. What's your reaction? In, in my short experience, both in the corporate world as an individual yes. business person, I have had a lot of interaction with Kerry. It's scary at first, but I think you get used to it. At some point, if, if things are stuck up against you, they have an ADR office. There will be a, dis a separate discussion as to the effectiveness of that ADR office, but they actually, <coughs> but they actually have it. And so I want to encourage you to think about it and to s put in place an approach that helps you to resolve that dispute in a way that doesn't make you the poor, but you also contribute towards the resource raising avenues for this country. Uh, Chair, I want to stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much. You've had to give him a hand. These are your people. The thing that, uh, I, I think, uh, colleagues, for me, what runs uh, Prof is capacity. Uh, and I would say that three times capacity. So if you really, if, if you really want to make a difference, build capacity in the organization uh, to be able to prevent and resolve this. And there are a lot of good uh, bodies, including uh, the ones that are present here. CIAP has run a lot of courses on how to resolve uh, disputes, different models, whether it's arbitration, mediation, negotiation, and, and all that. So build organizational capacity. Make sure that it finds its way as one of those, uh, so you know that boards are meant to kind of from induction to almost identify areas or from evaluation areas that they need capacity. Make sure that this area finds its way. But don't only think about the capacity of the organization. Also think about yourself. Um, uh, mediation, they talk about self-mediation. Because inside us, there are a lot of conflicts eh, that happen. And we need, you can't go telling people are going to resolve your conflicts, and you, you are just a classic case study of conflicts. You see, <laughs> there is a problem there. So you, you that is where that world of emotional intelligence there is a there is a there's a quadrant. It has four boxes in it, and it basically talks about what you should do with uh, your inner space. Um, I think the first one is uh, people who you might know something about yourself. Remember, emotional intelligence about self awareness and self control. So you might know something about yourself others don't. You know situations like that. You have your secrets, isn't it? You walk around. I have a relative somewhere here in Nairobi until now I don't know where he stays. But when you try and follow yeah, you need to be a CID, a DCI to follow uh, where the guy is. So you, he has a lot of secrets. Eh? So he knows, others don't. You need to deal with that gap, uh, which often means uh, you need to be a bit more transparent. That's what we talk about. The other cases where you either uh, you, you, you don't know something about yourself, others know. You know, you made that situation where you you are the, you don't know what others know. You, have you ever entered a room where you you don't know what everybody knows about you? <laughs> very very uh, interesting situation. So in that case, they talk about self empowerment. You know, building a self awareness uh, level so that you are not the joke that everyone is laughing at, and you are not aware that you are the joke. 
the other things uh, also they encourage organizations where you don't know and others don't know. Have you met a situation like that? Where you don't know yourself, even others, when you do it, they say, I, I didn't believe so and so could do it. And even you, you say, I don't believe I could do such a thing. So normally crisis is what brings out that side of you. And um, they talk about uh, moving out of your comfort zone because a lot of disputes emerge because the comfort zone has been broken and people are very insecure. Um, and you want to wait, you aim at a level of self-awareness, both at work and uh, yourself as an individual, where what you know, your working book. You know people say I'm a working book. Um, and everybody can see what you are. So that is the one, capacity. The other, of course, is policy, to make sure that you have got the policy infrastructure to support uh, what you call uh, good dispute uh, prevention and resolution practices. You have a uh, conflict of interest um, a policy in place. You have a whistleblowing policy uh, in place. You have a code of conduct. Uh, ethics and code of conduct. You are the CS, you are the driver of those things, making sure that they're in place so that they either uh, prevent or at least they lay the framework on how to deal with disputes. Mm -hmm. And then the last one, make sure you have the structure. Governance is also about structure. Um, do you have the structures for if this and this happens? Uh, these are the appropriate structures that we deal with it. I just mentioned one earlier on when I was speaking about uh, safe spaces, independent uh, organs that can hear, uh, places where people meet or platforms and people don't anticipate to be victimized. And uh, the conversations are not also superficial. There are many places where guys go and you ask, are there any questions? Are there any comments? And people are quiet. Did you understand? Yes. Why are they quiet? Because the environment does not give them the courage to want to say, no, uh, we didn't understand, or this is wrong, or this is right. Prof, I think that is it for me. Thank you. Good for me. Thank you very much. We give him a hand. He is very simple. I hope that you have learned something. I hope the organizations that are here organizations you're going to get into and develop from there. NCIA, find out what they do, get into it. ICS, get into it. If you're already not there, find out what they do. They can propel you for CIR, Kenya and UK, get into those uh, organizations. Indeed, interact with all of us. It is possible for you. It may not look possible this morning, but I think it is possible. Because ultimately, our experience is that you become what you think of most. The sum total of your mind is what you ultimately become. And then, sometimes why things don't work is because of uh, something called mediocrity. We don't do things to our best. So the little knowledge you're going to learn here and more, give it your best. And even where you work, give it uh, your best. So it is possible to reach wherever you want to do in terms of corporate governance, in terms of your own personal growth. And I look forward to seeing you a few years from now be where you wanted to be. Because the world is very interesting. It listens to you. If you tell, if you tell yourself today, I'm unwell, I'm unwell, by evening you'll be in ICU. <laughs> Definitely. But if you say, I'm okay, I'm okay, it shows on your face. The way your shoulders are, everything. You can be read like a book. It shows in your eye like that bull we spoke about earlier. So you must build internal peace before you resolve other people's uh, conflicts. You must have that self-awareness. And you must be able to say, today I'm facing the world to bring about peace and prosperity. Finally, never say I'm not lucky. You know, luck is something we can manufacture. You can make your own luck. What you do today determines 
what it is that you call lucky tomorrow. Those things that look hard, like coming here and listen, it is what then makes things possible. Now, I understand I have three minutes only, so we'll take two more questions, two and a half if you say, and then we close. My name is Cleophas Kiprodich, uh, an advocate, an arbitrator, a CS, and an accountant. Um, maybe just to, my, my own understanding or perspective of life would be an elder would have the final say. Uh, Calvin has talked of um, ADR in tax disputes. I would have wished that uh, we would have the final say, but let me just echo it may not be proper, but let me just echo it, that uh, whenever you have a task uh, task uh, dispute, think the best, the first stop should be the ADR office. <coughs> Unless it fails, then you should you now escalate it to the tribunal. And of course, when you're still at the tribunal or in court, you can still explore ADR. Uh, now, a comment on um, this uh, issue of entrenching ADR in our boards, etc. I, I, I think, or I see it, it's like we are moving ADR from a point of um, volume, uh, vol from a point of being voluntary to indirectly making them not voluntary in this sense. Um, I make a job application to ICS, I'm accepted. I go in there, the letter of offers. Um, uh, something to do with arbitration. Of course, I have the option of not accepting it because it is a contract. So I can choose not to accept it based on the ADR issue on it. But then I may not really have an option because I need this job. So I'll go into it, not because it is sort of voluntary, but then because I don't have another choice and uh, I don't think it's something new because when you move to the international arbitration space, you, you, you get to a situation whereby uh, there's an investor coming into maybe Kenya. Kenya needs this investment. The investor comes in with uh, its own ADR uh, clauses. We would not, it's not really something that is desirable for us. <coughs> but then we really need this investment. So we accept it, but Yes, it is voluntary, but at the same time, it's not really that voluntary. So maybe a comment on that. Thank you. One and a half more. Hey, I'm Steve Kyoko, and my question goes to Dr. Wing Mutuma. He talked, up, he talked about culture. And my question is, how can organizations ensure there is harmony between its culture and the ADR methods that are being brought in into the organizations? Hi everyone, my name is Esther. I wanted to ask, uh, there's an emphasis that has been placed that uh, when you're appointed as an ADR, as a mediator or whatever uh, position you'll be taking, then you have to act in the best interest of that organization. And my question comes in, then at what point are you neutral in this uh, form of uh, ADR, in the sense that uh, if the organization has appointed you to be a mediator and then you have to act in the interest of that company, then why should then the conflict be brought to you? Because at the end of the day, you're not neutral. It's, it's not a win-win situation according to my understanding. Maybe a clarity on that would be appropriate. Okay. Uh, you get good answers. We can yeah. see the proof. Uh, the last one I let uh, Emeritus respond to it. I suspect there is a misunderstanding there, but uh, he is going to clarify. Cleophas, I'm very happy to see there are so many multidisciplinary professionals that are coming up. I noted CIAB, uh, CPA, K, CS. For me, that gives me a lot of joy because that's where the world is actually going. Uh, so please, you, I'm sure you can see the synergy of all the worlds now as you move across. Uh, my this question of voluntary, the voluntary nature of media has been the subject of a lot of debate. In fact, the debate popped up, as Professor will tell you, with the court and expedition. 
process. You know where the court stand, you go for mediation. And so everyone was saying, but this is meant to be voluntary. For me, I think there are two issues that we need to put to the side. First, um, I draw analogies with the health uh, industry. Uh, you know those vaccinations that you take, polio and all that? Uh, and health is normally meant to be a constant given thing, but there's a place for the greater good. They tell you, we can't accept you to move around. Uh, because what is likely to uh, emerge uh, is going to be more consequential. Again, COVID also taught us very interesting uh, lessons. There are a lot of voluntary issues. <coughs> I, so that's my first one, that you can uh, have a discussion around how this voluntary platform um, is now turning, as it were, quote unquote, coercive. Uh, and parents do that every day with their children. There are many things they say really the greater good demands that you go through this process. The other, of course, is we do this with the court and next mediation process. We meet people who are not very willing to be there in the room. And there is an additional skill that the mediator must have when they are doing their opening uh, statements and all of that to be able to show the necessity of that process. You are almost, as it were, the flag bearer of why you actually should be in that mediation. And, and sometimes human beings are creatures of rationale. When, you, when they, they are persuaded, the involuntary person, and that is where what we really push at, becomes now an active participant. They are actually consensual. But I think uh, every just will speak more of that. I have done that a lot, and I've seen them take an angle out uh, and then uh, make very, very powerful contributions. When you start seeing the cost of not going ADR, I tell you the case will be made for you to go ADR. The cost is so severe when it comes to relationships. Time, if you're in the construction industry, what is going to happen? And cost, financial resources, um, <coughs> reputation, that someone would have to be mad to completely resist it and say to um, continue. The one, Steve uh, Kyoko, I've always suggested um, that the harmony between culture and policy and strategy uh, has always got to be top down. Remember, we've come from bottom up, <laughs> top down. Now, this is not a political issue. Everyone follows the cue from the top. You want to change the approach or the thinking around dispute resolution, get the chair and get the board to leave it. When I have a real life situation of an organization that um, is the insurance sector, it was a, it's a top three in the country. We did a board evaluation of that organization and the way they changed the game was because after wrangling and all of that, the board initiated mechanisms that it used to demonstrate this is how we're going to do it. And then it was easy for everybody to accept. The problem when you are trying to tell guys to accept something that you're not doing, that's where now there's what you call a cultural dissonance. They will report, revert to the default, what they see, rather than what you have written in policy. So you have to make sure that there are many cues that you set up that are calling upon what they see, symbols, stories that are around the narrative that is being created, how you're distributing power, who has power, so they start to see, oh, oh actually these guys mean what they say. I think that was an equal news thinking. You know the guy of Singapore, very, very powerful person, he believed if people see it in the leader, don't worry, they will imitate it. The biggest problem we have in many corporations, sometimes also in the country and society, what people see and what they hear, there is a dissonance. I mean, what I hear, including policy documents. So, this is a corruption free zone. So, maybe you're going to those offices. <laughs> but what you are seeing, uh, just <coughs> you know, something else is happening. I mean, it just before you answer that, let me say something about uh, mediation. At least for today, come out with this definition mediation. If you want to start with mediation, the continuation of negotiation. The two are linked. 
you are negotiating, you can't agree with the deadlock, and a third party comes in. So what was a diet, what is called a diet, becomes a trial. And the third party can either be imposed on you, or you invite the third party. In both cases, the job of the third party is not necessarily to be the neutral. No. There are very many forms of uh, mediation, facilitative, evaluation. Then there are all called collaborative approaches. And in collaborative approaches, the mediator comes in with an agenda. Could be an agenda for peace, an agenda for something else. Kofi Annan came to Kenya with an agenda. Agenda for the West. Maybe clothed as an agenda for peace. But the greatest thing a mediator brings to the table is power. The power to get two parties to continue talking, not neutrality. Are we together? But that's a discussion for another day. Thank you. Uh, now, Calvin. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for the questions that uh, come through. Uh, I, I think there was a misunderstanding on the, on the last question that was posed. You've not been appointed by LSK into JSC as a mediator. You've been nominated as a representative, as a board member, as a commission. So when you are there and there is an interest for LSK, which is at variance with the interest for JSC itself, which one should you take? Should you espouse what is good for JSC? Or should you say, no, 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 I was sent here by LSK, so I can only espouse their interest. So that was the nature of the, of the discussion. And I say you balance where you can, and where you can't, you espouse the interest of the organization for which you're serving. What is good for it? So I wasn't looking at it in the context of I have been appointed as a mediator. No, it is as a board member, as a commissioner. I think we're clear about that. Um, clear first. Inherent in your question is an unstated uh, conclusion that maybe this involuntary idea is not a good thing. You didn't say it, but it's implicit in your question. Now, I am yet to see a situation like that where the option to, to exercise ADR as a first option is a bad thing. Remember, if my offer letter has an arbitration clause, if you read the, employee, the, the Arbitration Act, nothing stops me from going to court at first to get interim orders of protection. Is there anything that stops me? Absolutely none. So if my employer is threatening to do something that would harm me, I have an option of declaring a dispute and we go to arbitration, or I have an option of first going to court, getting that order, then now let's go to arbitration. At the end of the day, I am yet to see a situation where having options is a bad thing. Okay? That, that's, that's all I wish to say. I also abide by the, my colleague's comment. Thank you, and back to Richard. Thank you very much. We give ourselves a hand. And uh, I'll hand over back the organizers so that you tell us what is. Thank you so much, uh, Prof. Can we move away from that? Yes, sure. sure. So uh, we are almost getting closer to the end of our uh, breakfast. We are just remaining with two activities that is the photo session and. Uh, of thanks. So before I invite my colleague to give a photo of thanks, I think it's uh, only fair for us to appreciate ourselves. We are going to do five factorials. The first one being for the uh, panelists, second one being for the moderator, uh, the next one being for NCIA, ICS, and ourselves for finding time to be here. So let's give ourselves five factorials. I'll be leading. Go. 
Thank you so much. Allow me to invite my colleague, uh, Osem Tori, to give a photo of thanks. Then Marion will lead us on the photo session. Thank you. Good morning, colleagues. Good morning. Uh, thanks so much for this opportunity to come and uh, um, give both of thanks here. And um, just before I just appreciate everyone who has participated in this program, I would like first to thank God for seeing us through this morning to come and, uh, and uh, learn about ADR in the space of a resolution of governance disputes. Um, just starting with the CEO NCIA, um, actually when I came here in the morning, I thought ADR, ADR is uh, something which has been left for lawyers. I was asking uh, my colleague out there from NCIA, uh, if I'm not a lawyer, can I become a member of, uh, can I do arbitration and all that? But even from the people who are in this room, and even from the discussion and how I was guided, it is possible to, to become an arbitrator and uh, to venture into this space. So for the people who are in here, um, maybe those who are struggling with the same question, you can, uh, it's, an, it's a place where we, sh we can explore, um, trying to see what we can do there. Thanks so much to NCIA, the, the CEO, Lawrence Wirori. I, I don't see him in the room, but uh, in his absence, we are grateful for the organization, for even the partnership, for their staff who have uh, come up with the process of organizing for this. Together with our with, with ICS, as you is here, we want to pass our regards to ICS and the uh, NCIA for taking that part to bring this um, event together. Um, also, coming to our facilitators, uh, starting with our moderator, uh, Professor Muigwa. Professor Muigwa, I was looking forward to meeting him. The first time I heard about Professor Muigwa, he's a champion of this idea. Remember, they are, were in a, a call somewhere, and um, there was a hot discussion about uh, passing some, uh, some penalties, and the professor was saying, that's not the way to go. We need to explore other avenues whereby there is a win-win situation for us and where we can not only looking at the present but also even in the future. Remember, he gave our, our CEO a comment that when you are digging holes, dig small ones because today you are CEO, maybe tomorrow when you are not CEO, you are going to fall into that hole which we have dug. So, uh, Prof, thank you so much. and. Um, uh, also sparing your time to come and speak here and facilitate this session. It was, Professor is a very busy man. I know him when you call Prof, when you don't give him enough notice, he'll tell you, I'm sorry. So, Prof, we appreciate your time to come this morning and uh, facilitate this session. We are so much grateful. Uh, Dr. Motuma, uh, part of the panelists, thanks so much for sparing your time to come and speak on this topic. Uh, last week I was with Dr. Mutuma in Mombasa and uh, we were training some, uh, some organization there and uh, Dr. was pre was prepared to do a session and it turned out to be a dispute dissolution session. We deviated completely from the discussion and we did on disputes only. So it's, it's an area where there is a great opportunity for us to get into. As is Calvin has mentioned about Dr. Strike, about KRA, the regulators who are represented here, I think it's an avenue we would want us to take forward and see how do we incorporate it into our organization so that we see how uh, we produce court cases and all that. Remember, Lawrence Murori said, I think we are moving from calling it alternative dispute resolution to appropriate dispute resolution. I think it's, for sure, it's an appropriate di dispute resolution and uh, I was speaking to my colleagues, and we were saying, I think this an avenue, this is a key aspect we need to incorporate in most of our programs, if not all, on this uh, alternative dispute resolution, because it's an area where 
when we are doing any capacity building for any organization, it's something which comes out prominently. Thanks so much, Dr. Terry, for sharing your perspective about this conversation. It's just Calvin Yachotti. Uh, thank you so much for sharing those perspectives. You just mentioned that um, you took the, uh, you went to court for the case which is for the strike which we are seeing currently. I think you need also to, and I'm, I'm very sure maybe you've done this, but if you've not done it, to propose to the parties that um, there is a place for arbitrators to come and see how do we bring uh, peace in all that so that we move forward. Thanks so much, Dr. for uh, Calvin, for sharing your insights and all the experiences which you've accumulated over the years on matters dispute resolution. This is Jacqueline Wahenya in um, absentia. Also, would like to thank her for sharing more about uh, even coming up with ADR policies. You know, um, uh, in, in, the, in the course of my career, and uh, when I was being hired at ICS, I was asked this question, and it's a question which I've been asked in, a, in some interviews which I have attended before. If there are colleagues, if there are people who are fighting in an organization, how, how do you approach that? And uh, uh, sometimes you, you struggle to, to explain how you do that, but see, you are not planning to leave. But when I'm called now for an interview somewhere again, and the same question is posed, I know at least I have a place to start from. We need an ADR policy so that we see how do we resolve these conflicts. Uh, also to, to Oscar and uh, Kimeli for organizing this event. We are so much grateful. And the entire team at ICS, Koki, and the uh, uh, NCIA, we are so much grateful for all what you've done to come together with this program. And then lastly, to the participants who are here, it would not be possible to do this event, this breakfast meeting, without your participation. So we are so much grateful. And uh, going forward, I think we are going to see how we do such capacity building sessions for uh, the young members, because we are told we are the future. Uh, those people who have we've been told that, that future is coming, and uh, we are the future. So we need to see how we get into this. So uh, thank you so much for sparing your time this morning to come and listen to this conversation. All the discussions from this uh, uh, conversation were being recorded. We are going to see how do we capture all the discussion which have been discussed here to enrich even the partnership which my CEO was speaking about, about uh, ICS and NCIA coming together and see how do we capacity build several organizations on matters uh, and call it appropriate dispute resolution. Thank you so much for your time. May God bless us and all the best in your organization. Thank you.